Hi, my name is Rita Amri and I welcome you to IP series where we talk about recent IP cases and developments globally. And if this is your first time joining us, please don't forget to favorite my podcast on Anchor and you can also listen to it on other platforms, distribution platforms. On today's episode, I have another guest with me and we'll be talking about the FMCG industry. Like I've always said, that IP is everywhere, intellectual property interfaces with every industry and sector. So, this is um, episode is great for lawyers, law students, entrepreneurs, and also the relevant stakeholders. So, I'm going to invite our guest for today to tell us all about the FMCG sector. So, I'd like to welcome our speaker for today, Vivian. Vivian, could you just introduce yourself and, you know, just give us like a brief bio of what you actually do? Hello, everyone. My name is Vivian Olusu Feshe. I have a background in law and it suffices to say that I am licensed to practice law in Nigeria. I have interacted with stakeholders within the FMCG space for well over eight years. And um, I have worked in private practice. And after private practice, of course, I moved in-house and I've worked with two well-known FMCG companies that have a category of well-known brands in Nigeria. Fantastic, fantastic. So you mentioned FMCG. I talked about it, but I didn't tell the audience what's the full meaning of FMCG. So what is FMCG? Okay, so basically, on on a general spectrum, FMCG is an acronym for fast-moving consumer or consumption goods. And this simple feature for you to know that a product falls within the FMCG sector is that the product sells quickly and it sells at a relatively low cost. Other features could mean that um, they, they have a short shelf life. And when you say a product has a short shelf life, it's generally taken that that product's um, life, lifespan is three years and below. It's a high consumer demand and turnover for that, those goods. And um, you tend to have a high quality and frequency of purchase of that good. And in a way, the list is the fact that there is a low pricing metric that's applicable to an FMCG product. And of course, as it transcends from there, you tend to find a low profit margin. So for those who fall within the FMCG space, it's safe to say that um, it is a numbers game, you know, for those who, 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 who sell within the FMCG space. So you did mention the low profit margin. How does that really work in... A, in an economy that is, you know, going through, um, say, a recession, how do you guys come about the prices? Do you just fix any price that you feel is affordable for everyone or is tailored to a particular class? Okay, so even within the FMCG space, you have the premium brands and you have the one that appeals to um, those other than the premium brands. Um, pricing as a metric is definitely determined by market forces. So the consumer perception about the goods, um, a spectrum of consideration given to other goods within that class will determine um, how much value or premium that is placed on on a particular um, good which fall within the FMCG industry. Um, what's your daily work routine like, you know, within the FMCG space? What do you really do? What um, services do you render? What are the prospects out there? Okay, so first and foremost, let me start by saying that as a lawyer who works within the FMCG space, the core of your activity is still that managing legal risks. Now, that is your not staff. That is your compass, that is your guide, you know, to carrying on in advising the businesses um, that you work with. Um, So it it suffices, you know, to say that every other thing that I do flows from that core of managing legal risk, whether 
it has to do with contract management, whether it has to do with you know, structural risk, advising the structural risk, whether it has to do with advising the businesses that I work to to prevent or mitigate um, litigation, or regulatory issues as well. So it all transcends from there. And another major aspect is the fact that, you know, risk in itself uh, and the ISO 31000 has helped to define what risk is. Risk as the effect of uncertainties on business objectives. So as a legal practitioner that works within the FMCG sector, you would want to understand the business objectives. And basically, business objectives are specific and measurable um, results that companies hope to achieve, you know, by churning out those products and sending out those products. It's, so just as legal risk is the North Star for in-house councils that work within the legal department and interact with the business, business objective is the, is the North Star, you know, of, of the companies that you work with. So it tends to give that business a direction on where it is focused. Act, you know, what the core of the sustaining operations are. It determines how the organization also allocates its resources as well. And when you work as a, as a legal practitioner within an FMCG space, you would want to align your risk strategies with the business objectives. Now, in doing that as well, you know, we also layers with relevant stakeholders. So we try to gain insights from stakeholders that interact with the business. And that stakeholders transcend from the customers to the consumers, to the employees, to the regulators and the governmental body, and also the host community. And the business objectives, as I said earlier, being the North Star of the business would shine light into how impactful you know, your role as a legal practitioner would be at the end of the day um, whilst working within the FMCG industry. You did mention, you talked about um, the relevant stakeholders and the community. So I wanted to find out from you, what are those um, relevant laws that we should be looking out for? And other than the consumers, who are the other stakeholders that we have to okay, be Okay, so, you know, at, at the core of what the FMCG does is products. So part of the things it does is to put out a product or put out its brands there to meet a particular need um, as created by the consumer. So first and foremost, the first focus of any FMCG company is the consumer. And of course, you know, in Nigeria, um, uh, there's, there, 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 there is um, regard for consumer rights. So one of the first laws that FMCG companies would be definitely exposed to are laws that secure the rights of consumers. So both at the federal and the state levels, we have so far of okay. the activities yes, of the players within the FMCG industry is churning out products which meet the needs of the consumers. Of course, before then, they would have gathered consumer insights to understand the pain point, you know, that they need to address when they send out these products to consumers. Now, on, on the one hand, whilst understanding the pain point, the drive is all But on the other hand, we know that in Nigeria, consumers have rights. So, that those who play within the FMCG sector will be exposed to and need to adhere to will be consumer-related laws that sell out consumer rights. Now, we have those laws replicated at both the federal and the state level. So at the federal level, in 2019, we had the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Act, you know, which prescribes for um, rules and regulations and processes for companies to follow when it speaks to consumer rights. It also provided for activities that, that are prohibited 
for companies to carry on. So, for example, anti-competitive and antitrust activities are not allowed in Nigeria. So, of course, those who play within the FMCG space need to um, take a look at those laws so that they will be well guided. Now, that's with regards to the uh, consumer. In addition to that as well, um, FMCG, those who play within the FMCG space, um, while sending out products, make certain affirmations. So it is expected that whilst you make those affirmations, you are not overly um, uh, misrepresenting what your product can do because there, there are regulations that speak against that. You know, uh, We have adv advertising codes that um, speak against you making a misrepresentation or or even doing a comparative analysis between your products, direct comparative analysis between your products and the products of um, a competition. So just to allow for an atmosphere of healthy competition, we have laws that speak, speak in that regard. Now, um, for, the, for, for, for the customers as well, you have laws that speak to contractual arrangements between manufacturers or distributors and customers. Of course, for you to sell products within the value chain, you need certain persons to push those products for you. And whilst you do that, you enter into contractual arrangements with each. Now, it's either you would allow the common law principles of contract arrangements to guide that framework, or you rely on the sales of goods framework to guide that framework, or you actually enter into a written arrangement, you know, where you can redefine the rules of the game, you know, whilst um, selling that product or whilst those products um, sip through the value chain, you know, to the final consumer. Of course, you have the... So the regulators play a huge role yeah. in managing those who play within the FMCG industry. Um, one of such regulators is NAFTA and um, SUN. So they provide guidelines, procedures, and framework for manufacturers and distributors who want to import products into Nigeria, who want to distribute pro um, FMCG products to, um, in Nigeria, who are here to market because there is actually an arm within the uh, within NAFDA that regulates and approves um, advert copies. So NAFDA even transcends looking into the into the um, integrity of the product that you're turning out to consumers, and even going ahead to also look at how yeah. you project that product, you know, to to the consumer. So you have a, a wide array. Um, it all depends on how your business model is skewed. So if you're an import dependent business, then you will be interfacing with the banks and you'll be interfacing with foreign exchange. So it's expected that, you know, you would have to align your processes to the relevant custom and exercise laws. You will have to um, align your processes with um, the relevant foreign exchange um, laws as the case may be. Um, also, the relevant com international commercial uh, transaction laws as well, you know, when, when it has to do with raw material importation. Uh, that being said, there is no manufacturer that has a manufacturing site that would not locate that manufacturing site in a host community. So it is expected that um, manufacturers have, um, um, but I, 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 let me say that again. So it's expected that manufacturers, whilst you know carrying on their daily activity, also gives credence to the host community where the manufacturer. So of course you have the environmental impact assessment, which all manufacturers are expected to um, comply with to show that they have met setting environmental and quality standards and what they do would not be harmful to the environment. To the environment. I'll take that again. 
and what they do would not be harmful to the environment where their business is located as well. So that is why you find manufacturers carrying on CSR activities um, to project their business in a good light to the host community, to also identify the pain points within the host community and meet that need. So the, 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 the business model of most FMCG companies is not just skewed to profit making, it also skewed to having and creating an impact you know, in the society. And what best place to start that but with the host community? I really agree with you. I really agree with you. So now to, to my favorite part and topic, how important is intellectual property to the FMCG industry? Wow, you cannot divert intellectual property from the FMCG industry. Now, IP's primary focus is encouraging innovation. And we all know that innovation is in the very DNA of the FMCG sector. You know, um, from the Industrial Revolution, which has shaped world commerce, you know, we have come to witness, you know, the value of intellectual property. And of course, manufacturers played a huge part in the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. Research and development, R&D, you know, have ushered in new and improved technology in a bid to um, provide that competitive edge. In, in the world of commerce. And for you to have that legal basis to sell your product and to actually exploit that product, you need to, you know, protect that product. So be it from the patent perspective, be it from a trademark perspective or a copyright perspective, and even your trade secrets as well. So we've come to see that IP plays a very huge part in um, uh, the FMCG um, space. Other than IP, what other, you know, laws or areas should FMCG actually um, concentrate on? Hmm. Okay, so looking at Nigeria uh, as a country and the fact that even most of our micro, small, medium companies, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, carry on businesses. So yes, other than I IP, what it. other areas should um, FFCG consider, you know, like data protection or any other type of um, areas that would actually boost the industry? Okay, so I think a major place where we tend to miss it, especially in Nigeria, now I'm speaking to the micro, small and medium scale businesses in Nigeria, is in the part okay. of R&D, that's research mm -hmm. and development. Now, that is what the large brands or the foreign or the multinationals have been able to perfect over time. So they're able to gain consumer insights and they're able to go back to the lab and work up products, you know, that would meet the specific needs of um, consumers. So uh, unlike those who play within the micro and the small and even the big, what I've come to understand or, or what I've come to see from especially young scale businesses in Nigeria is that you know, they do not invest in research and development. And that is what the foreign brands or the multinationals you know, or the large companies have been able to perfect over time. So they go into the market, they roll up their sleeves, and they get consumer insights. And they work those consumer insights into their operations so much that you know, um, they improve on the technology, adapt those consumer insights in improving on their product, and they're meeting the specific needs, 
you know, of that. So I, I think those are one of the areas that um, that, uh, that this uh, enterprise space or the micro um, enterprise space um, need to actually take take a deep um, to take deep considerations to. And now taking it back to what are the other laws, um, I've also noticed as well, you know, that the regulators, so I also noticed that the regulators also need to, you know, in engaging more with the micro, small and medium scale businesses so that they can understand their pain points. So it's not just about enforcement of the law, but, you know, they're more, inclined to supporting these businesses, haven't understood their pain points, you know, so that they can also help catalyze and scale, you know, the micro, the small and the medium scale businesses so that they can favorably compete with, with the likes of the foreign brands and um, the likes of the multinationals as well. Okay. We know we experienced a pandemic. What are those um, trends that or issues that were exposed by um, COVID? What are the trends we're looking out for post-COVID, basically? Okay. Okay, so um, generally, you know, the advent of the pandemic created a global crisis, <laughs> which have now, yes. which, which, which have now transcended into an economic downturn. You know, governments were forced to apply mitigating measures like social distancing, partial or total lockdown, you know, to contain and manage the spread of the virus. Now, for instance, so yeah. governments were forced to apply mitigating measures, uh, um, whether transcending from um, social distancing to partial or total lockdown to contain and manage the spread of the virus. So, for instance, we found that schools and markets and workplaces, even ports of entry, you know, was affected by the um, lockdown. We also saw that um, global trade dropped and um, we witnessed a lot in, 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 of course, that impacted in um, operations of those um, within the FMCG sector. Uh, on the flip side as well, you know, due to the dynamic nature of the sector, consumer spending and um, uh, preferences, you know, and needs also changed as well. So you found that players just quickly revamped and reviewed their working models, you know, to suit the changing times. So for example, you know, we witnessed the rise in demand of medical devices. So if you remember at that time, there was a need for nose masks. Yeah. And there was also a need for hand sanitizers. So we found a lot of businesses pivoting, you know, to provide um, such um, uh, product offerings, you know, for people. And, you know, businesses that had operated uh, within the brick and mortar space, we now found them now digitalizing, you know, their activities and even operating um, businesses within the e-commerce space. Um, in addition to that as well, you know, there uh, became an urgent need, you know, for businesses to create infrastructure um, around data protection, um, cyber security, because now businesses had moved from the brick and mortar into the digital space. So they, they, they had to tighten up. It became very easy for, for there to be data leaks. So, of course, they now had to tighten up um, their processes to prevent um, data breach and of course most players within the sector adopted flexible or remote working you know during that time and created interactive tools to um, keep in touch with their um, customers their consumers suppliers and um, the regulators as well also the regulators also supported within that time because i'm aware that um, the navdat actually revamped its erp system where People can apply remotely for um, registration, you know, and they will take up um, that discourse from there. So rather than you going there physically to their office, you know, we found that 
we adopted an ERP, an enterprise risk um, uh, management system that would, you know, collect information of applicants and then that will be treated. Of course, now we have seen how that has led to some of our regulators like the uh, CAC, yeah. you know, having to revamp their processes. So now you can actually apply, even for your post-incorporation transactions, you can even apply remotely. You need not visit the office. As a matter of fact, people are not required to even come to the offices anymore. So the Corporate Affairs Commission, you know, revamps its processes. And this is, it, 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 it's not magic. It, it all, you know, flowed from the pandemic and, you know, the, the problems or insights, you know, they were able to gather, you know, from um, customers not being able to carry on registration at the CAC. And of course, now that has improved, you know, the regulator's perspective in dealing with, with, with the customers. So uh, on a general spectrum, the COVID-19 brought the good side and also brought the bad side with it. Uh, but... Um, you know, even though we, we can still feel the downturn because, you know, at that time, we had people who lost their jobs, even within the sector. We had people who lost their jobs within the sector. But then again, it has opened the, 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 the space for innovation. So we, we find people moving from uh, being unemployed to actually... Um, moving into the sector uh, as being an entrepreneur. And guess what? What is the low-hanging fruit? This is the FMCG sector, you know, so you tend to find lots of entrepreneurs thriving, you know, within the FMCG space. Let's talk about force majeure. We heard a lot about that during the pandemic. Most of the webinars were on force majeure. Um, what's the relationship or how did that what impacts did it make in the FMCG um, industry? Well, it made a huge impact within the FMCG space. One of such impacts is, you know, um, the business models of the FMCG industry is skewed as first and foremost, you sourcing for materials, especially when you are yeah. a manufacturer. So it's not like you're dependent on the final products and you're just a distributor. If you're a manufacturer, you have to source for your raw materials. And one of the things that um, the pandemic, you know, brought forth is the fact that the borders were closed. There was a supply chain block. You couldn't source for raw materials. You couldn't even meet your underlying contractual obligation. So that, that was huge. It, it, the the, the COVID-19, you know, disrupted the supply chain and um, companies were forced to actually revisit their contracts, you know, with their suppliers or with their customers. Uh, they had to forbear, you know, all the stakeholders had to discuss ways of moving ahead. And being that it was a pandemic, you know, it led to a fundamental loss, um, even loss of profit, loss of revenue. Um, stakeholders just had to sit down on the round table to discuss how they were weighed ahead of it. But, um, the COVID-19 disrupted um, the supply chain yeah. and then businesses and relevant stakeholders within the value chain had to sit down and adopt practical approach in meeting their contractual obligation. Um, we saw this with, with, with the banks who, have fund, who had funded the varying ventures where um, stakeholders had to go discuss with them. And we saw, you know, how the banks were supporting in pushing forward um, payment obligations. Um, suppliers as well, you know, we had to engage those, those that play within the, the, the FMCG space know that they had to engage the raw material suppliers, you know, to source for alternative um, raw materials you know, from alternative sources, if possible, you know. Um, also, customers as well, whether your distributors, be it your distributors, be it your wholesalers, you have to, re you have to engage them, you know, to let them know that the, the 
numbers that we have agreed, you know, as a target for this year, you know, we have to look at it once more. So it, 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 it actually, well, it really disrupted the sector. And another side of this as well, you know, another issue, you know, and of that, you know, that was exposed in all of this is one, the relevance of um, transferring business interruption risk. So we all know that as an aspect of legal risk is you treating your risk. And in treating your risk, you can decide to have a captive fund in-house where you make provisions in the event that there's a loss. On the other hand, you may decide to transfer your risk to an underwriter. Now, we know that the pandemic in itself is of a fundamental nature and the insurers or the underwriters now in this instance, you know, um, th 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 there's still a difficulty in them coming up with a solution, you know, to meet that gap. So as it were, the first major issue, you know, that flowed from the um, COVID-19 exposed this. And um, at the moment, I read somewhere, you know, that um, insurers are actually looking at means of deciding on and um, developing processes to look and to study the effect that pandemic um, has, you know, in the economy and how they can actually come in to ameliorate or to mitigate that fundamental fundamental risk. Another, another aspect, of course, you know, the downside we saw, you know, from the impact of the um, COVID-19 first major, as the case may be, is the enforcement activities of, of the federal and the state government. Yes, they brought up regulations, but we saw very poor enforcement mechanism adopted, you know, to, to manage compliance. So um, the, the government didn't do, you know, pretty well in, in ensuring, you know, for, for enforcement. And really, I, I think that just simply flows from the economic situation because people had to go out there to source for food. People had to go out there to look for food. So there is this, um, there is this complacency, you know, even... As that today, there is this complacency. Even when you go on the road and you walk, you see people are not even adhering to the safety guidelines that the um, NCDC, you know, prescribed. People are no longer using their face masks. You know, they are not no longer applying caution. You know, in in um, dealing with, with with people or, or or even catering for themselves. Then, of course. Uh, there was a huge dependency on foreign materials, just as, as I said earlier. So that definitely opens up a need for us to adopt um, backward integration. So businesses that were not reliant on importation, you know, looked within and the raw materials they adopted, you know, locally, you know, still helps them to remain relevant um, in that time. We can't also take our eyes away from the fact that there are infrastructural deficits as well. Um, so that in itself also affected um, businesses at that time. So they couldn't, most businesses couldn't thrive at that time. And um, the government as well, you know, there was forced subvention and intervention um, programs, so much so that the people, or most people couldn't, you know, actually attest the fact that those subject, uh, uh, subvention programs impacted um, on them. So I think the issue with the pandemic of COVID-19 has really opened up a whole lot of issues on, uh, on, on the table for relevant stakeholders to speak and consider, you know, and since we're talking about the FMCG sector, for those who play within the FMCG sector to sit down and consider to see, to take their learnings first and foremost, and to see how they can skew their business models to prevent um, those issues that we experienced or that flowed, you know, from the issue that we had with with, with the pandemic, and prevent that, you know, in in future, in the event that this repeats itself. 
So um, in wrapping up now, what trends do you think we should look out for and what advice would you have for wow. entrepreneurs, lawyers, law lot students, of and then the relevant I, I think um, are inherent within this sector. First and foremost is the fact that businesses need to adopt technology in, in, in their daily activities. You know, we have to start to look at things from an enterprise perspective. So how does your activity affect another department's activity? So on a general spectrum. So if you're reviewing risk models, you need to review risk models from an enterprise perspective and not from an individualistic point of view. Now I'm talking about the different departments that make up uh, an FMCG component or a company. So each and every one of those components needs to adopt um, an enterprise approach in addressing its business objectives and an enterprise approach in performance um, generally. Of course, another trend that we saw uh, within that time as well is the growth of the e-commerce case. So now the advice really is for medium or micro or small enterprises to harness the opportunity of, of the e-commerce space to scale the business. And just flowing from adopting technology, it is now moving from the brick and mortar into the digital space. Well, I, I, I think um, businesses need to actually look deep down and you know, do, do a general analysis all those repetitive tasks need to be aggregated and the decision needs to be made as for efficiency. Then, of course, another trend is the fact that consumers are becoming more intelligent and more decisive in their decisions to um, purchase um, an FMCG product. Cons uh, the manufacturers or the distributors now have a responsibility you know, to ensure that whatever products that they churn out there actually meet the specific needs, you know, or, or, or of the consumer. And um, for, for lawyers, you know, lawyers who have an interest within the FMCG space need to first and foremost understand the sector and all of these trends that have played out over time. We also need to study the pain points of the industry, you know, and create solutions to address these needs. So we shouldn't have the mindset of lawyers. So lawyers tend to be focused on the technical aspects of, of what they do, you know, without giving credence to the practicality or without looking at how they can align that technical aspect to business needs. So lawyers who have an interest in the FMCG sector or already within the FMCG sector need to actually study, you know, the pain points of the relevant stakeholders and see how they can turn out their uh, personal objectives into meeting um, the value proposition of, of, the, of the company. And of course, uh, uh, for, for entrepreneurs, agility is the key word. So like I said earlier, just to put that and aggregate that, Entrepreneurs need to, you know, adopt tools that will help to create a more efficient business output. Um, you have various enterprise um, tools, you know, that can help to create that needed efficiency and still achieve the controls that you need to put in place. Um, consumer engagement, you know, and of course for the entrepreneur, they need to get a lawyer. So I see most businesses do not find the need for a lawyer necessary until there is an issue on ground. I think businesses shouldn't be skewed to, business models shouldn't be skewed in that way because in-house lawyers or lawyers generally that of course understand the FMCG sector seem to, tend to have a proactive approach to risk issue beforehand so that you can take preventive measures. And even when that issue arises, you know, you have a soft landing. It wouldn't be as worse as, you know, it would have been if you had not sought 
um, prior advice. So basically, that would be my advice in a general spectrum to lawyers, to entrepreneurs, and um, to relevant stakeholders. Hey, thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you. This has been really interesting and um, I've learned a lot. I hope the listeners also have learned something across you. Are you on LinkedIn? Are you on Twitter? Um, how can we reach out to you, basically? Okay, I'm on LinkedIn. You can reach me on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, I would respond to, to, to all your questions and your queries. I'm also open to criticisms as well. So if, if you <laughs> think that, <laughs> so if you think that um, there are certain things, um, you know, one has to consider um, within the space as well. I'm I'm open to to, to ideas, to new ideas. Basically, well, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure being thank here. You thank you. Okay, guys, there you have it. Um, let me know what you think about the FMCG space and what other um, sectors you might want me to look at the um, relationship between that sector and intellectual property. Until the next IP series, thank you once again for joining and listening. Don't forget to favorite my podcast. Um, yeah, see you next time. Bye. Thank you.